NBC University of the Air, a public service of the National Broadcasting Company and its affiliated independent stations, presents another chapter in the historical series, We Came This Way. Tonight's story, John Bright. John Bright, for the most part, has been forgotten. It seems to be one of our human failings to bury the names of men who have done our race the most good in a deep and dark well. John Bright, dead less than 50 years, is betwixt and between the depths and top of that well. And yet, what he did in his lifetime affects the lives of practically everyone in the English-speaking world. He was an Englishman who loved England, but who loved his fellow man even more. What we will tell you tonight is the story of one man's fight against the rulers of a nation, but for that nation's people. Remember, it's the story of a man. The man called John Bright, who, as we opened the chapter, is sitting before an open fireplace with his friend Richard Cobden. The year is 1839. Richard, it's good to have you back from America. Tell me, what's it like, this America? Yeah, they're no longer Englishmen, they're Americans. But even the language is different. I'd say that in a hundred years, we'll be hard put to understand them. Did you see any Indians? Few, none of the warring tribes. John, those Americans are hewing a new land out of a wilderness, a new empire. They're fighters and they're free men, and they'll progress beyond our wildest dreams. Oh, it'll take them a million years to get where we are. I'd say less than a hundred. Cobden, if I didn't know you better, I'd say you were well on your way to an asylum. But they're progressive and we're stodgy. They've got vision and... We've got the corn laws. Oh, I knew there was something behind your speech-making, Richard. You aren't going to drag me into politics. My father and I have got the mill running smoothly. I'm marrying Helen in two weeks. I'm a thoroughly happy and contented man. While all England is on the verge of disaster. These oppressive corn laws, John, they are making beggars and slaves of free Englishmen. <laughs> to hear you talk, we'd better call out the grenadiers immediately. Richard, why don't you forget about politics? I want to hear about America. How are the girls? <laughs> they really are uh... <laughs> But what do you care? You're going to be married. I know, but not for two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> two weeks later, he was married. He had everything that a man could ask for. One year followed another. He had a good home, a pretty wife, a young daughter, a good friend in Richard Cobden, and a fairly nice income. John Bright was content to stay in the sleepy town of Leamington and lead the quiet and simple life. He meddled a bit in the local affairs and lived quietly according to his Quaker background. Serenity was the word for his existence until... Typical English weather. Dank, gloomy, befitting my mood. I find it difficult to remember things. I have lost part of myself. My wife, Helen, died this morning. Well, John? Well, what, Richard? Did it work? No. It's been over six months since Helen died. I took the doctor's advice and traveled. But she was with me all the time. It didn't work, Richard. It didn't work. I didn't think it would. And what am I to do? Where am I to turn? You really want to know? I can't go on like this. I just can't find my old life. Then, John, start a new one. As simple as that. Well, you accept it like, like tea at four. I do. John, what I'm going to say to you may sound cruel, but it's true. You aren't the only one in England that's suffering. Uh, I don't say that you're pampering yourself. But if you want to see what real suffering is, get out of Leamington. Get out into England and find out for yourself what I've been talking about. See with your own eyes the slow death by starvation that's in store for our countrymen. More speech-making, Richard? Not this time, John. I want you to find out for yourself. <laughs> Sitting around an empty country house full of nothing but memories was more than John Bright could take. And so as a last resort, he acted on Richard Cobden's suggestion and traveled. Not to foreign countries in search of something new, but in his own country, 
to meet his own people. Warm out, isn't it? Bloom not, I'd say. Catch any fish yet? Not a one. My name's Bright. John Bright. Mine's Hutchinson. My friends call me Hutch. You work around here? Work right over there in that air on Mungary. Been working there off and on all my life. I work in a mill. I used to fish on Saturday, too. I hate fishing. Shouldn't have to do it. But my young ones has got to eat. I thought you men got good wages. Oh, I don't mean nothing. Sure, I'm making good wages. But the doctor says the stuff in fish is what's almost as good as what you can get from corn. Only you can't get corn. So, I fishes. No corn at all. Only for the rich, mister. Only for the rich. You know, I wish I was rich. You do? Why? Because I hate fishing. <laughs> From Bristol to Plymouth to Dover to Southampton, John Bright traveled from town to town, listening and talking to anyone who would strike up a conversation. Liverpool to Leeds to Hull to Norwich, Gloucester, Bedford, Colchester, and London. The things he saw seemed unbelievable. Famine in the times of plenty. And everyone's eyes had a haunted look of hunger. They're hungry, Richard. They're starving. There simply isn't any bread. I know. It was like that all over England. Richard, those corn laws are iniquitous. A blasphemy against the well-being of free men. They've got to go. I've been waiting a long time to hear that. This time we'll travel together. You have a gift of oratory, John, that moves men's hearts. Once you get them to a boiling point, I'll throw facts at them that they can't deny. I can't understand the blind stupidity of Parliament. At least we'll make a good try at having the corn laws repealed. We will try, Richard. We'll do it. And so the team of Bright and Cobden traveled throughout England to convince people the Corn Laws should be abolished. The Corn Laws, high duties on food, were vicious because in a country like England, which never grew enough food for all its factory working people, high food tariffs meant high food prices. Benefits and special privilege for the rich landowners, hunger for the poor. The most vicious sort of rationing for those who needed most got least. Hungry men said Bright are not free men. That, in a nutshell, was the essence of their fight. A fight for freedom in the free England that could come only when corn laws and hunger went. And yet, they had to convince even the poor whom the corn laws injured most that the laws were vicious. For corn laws there have been in one form or another for centuries. They were a habit. And few things are harder to drop than old habits, even when they hurt. So the famous team of Bright and Cobden talked and debated, debated and talked. Do you expect sympathy? You don't deserve it until you vote in the men who will repeal the corn laws. There's plenty to eat in the world. Just walk over to the docks and watch it being turned away from England because of the high duty. Yes, and take your children too. The least you can do is to let them see what food looks like. <laughs> Gentlemen, you have heard the opposition, and you have heard my colleague, Mr. John Bright. If what he said wasn't enough to convince you that the Corn Laws must go, I have a few facts that I dare anyone to deny. Together, Cobden and Bright debated wherever they could find an audience and a speaker to oppose them. Cobden was already a member of the House of Commons, and that, together with his travel, was costing him the fortune that he had accumulated from the business he now chose to neglect. Bright, too, was rapidly going through his money, but since his father was still active in the mill, he had no worries on that account. Bright's activities were causing worry in other quarters, however. In fact, as they went agitating the length and breadth of England, their reputation became such that finally they could no longer get anyone to oppose them in debate. They had every manufacturing town solidly behind them, it was then that John Bright decided upon the advice of his friend Richard Cobden to stand for the House of Commons, to join Cobden in the battle against the Corn Laws on the floor of Parliament itself. So he stood for a seat, and at last the votes were counted. I don't know what to think, Richard. I can't believe it. You haven't decided to quit, have you? No. 
I've made up my mind that I'll fight this battle until the day I die. But, well, this election, Richard. When I chose this district, I was sure of winning. I counted on the people. I thought they believed in us. Come in. Well, gentlemen, good evening. Huh. I've never seen two longer faces in my days. This isn't exactly a moment of celebration, Rogers. And stop looking so cheerful. Can't understand you two. Indeed, I can't. Richard, shall I throw him out or shall we share the pleasure? Throw me out, indeed. <laughs> Make it a point to come to congratulate a fellow and look at the treatment I get. You're slightly behind the times, Rogers. I lost the election. Lost, you say? Lost the election? <laughs> Seems to me you're the one that's behind the times. Well, what do you mean? Don't tell me you haven't heard. Heard what? Oh, my word, this is splendid. What an opportunity. What do you know? Yes, let's have it, men, before we do throw you out. Well, it seems it was a little matter of a mistake. Mistake? What kind of a mistake? Well, they gave him your votes and vice versa. Uh, was it the other way around? Uh, anyway, whatever it was, he's disqualified. Disqualified? Are you sure? <laughs> Official, old boy. Just posted on the board at the Flying Hare. John, do you hear that? I've won. Precisely, you've oh, won. Oh, that's wonderful. Oh, congratulations, wonderful. John. Can't understand you two. First, you want to throw me out? Now, you just ignore me. Richard, they didn't let us down. The people were behind us after all. Huh. Guess I'll just go down and get a drink and charge it to you. Yes, do, Rogers, do. Well, how'd you like it? Well, I don't know yet. After all, this is my first day. There's no better place to meet your colleagues than in the vestibules. I'll introduce you around. I feel as though it were my first day in school. Uh, Mr. Pearson. Oh, Corbin. Good day, good day. I want you to meet a new member, Pearson. Mr. Bright. How do you do, Mr. Pearson? Bright? Bright? Oh, you're the fellow that's making all that bother about the corn laws, aren't you? Don't like it. Don't like it one bit. Good day, sir. I gather he didn't like it. No, don't mind him. Uh, here's old Dixon. He's been here a long time. Oh, I see there, Cobden. Uh, did you see what happened to my umbrella? Uh, can't seem to find it anywhere. Oh, oh sorry, I didn't see you. I'm busy. Oh, I'm not busy. I'd um, like you to meet Mr. Bright, a, a new Bright, member. Eh? <laughs> I know you by your reputation, sir. I don't think you're going to enjoy your brief stay in Parliament. Uh, forgive me, I've got to find that umbrella. It's along there somewhere. Richard. I've got a fight on my hands. And they've got a surprise on theirs. Because I'm not here for a brief stay. I'm here until those corn laws go. And so the struggle in Parliament began. John Bright entered the House of Commons to face suspicion and hostility. Among his few friends, Cobden was the staunchest. But Bright had the eloquence, the voice. And it was a lone voice crying out against the lawmakers of an empire. The voice in the wilderness that demanded to be heard. Yes, the fight was on. The fight that would persist for five long years. Gentlemen, gentlemen, I would like to speak to you about the repeal of the nefarious corn laws. What again? Sit down. This is not the first time I have spoken against these vile and selfish laws, and it shall not be the last. But I shall be heard. The people of England are dying a slow death. Our empire is likely to wither away because of legislation that is starving the people at the root. I know of what I speak because I have met those people met them face to face. And they have very pinched faces, gentlemen. Very pinched faces. There were men in the government, important men who represented powerful interests. And John Bright and his speech making had grown from a petty annoyance to a threat that could overthrow them. For the first time, they began to doubt their power. They threatened. But Bright refused to be frightened. He refused to listen. Instead, he went out into the farm districts and continued his talks. Are you going to have a good harvest, my friend? Uh, not if we have the kind of rain we've been getting. Well, you've a tidy sum saved up to tide you over, no doubt. Oh, I wish I did have. You know, stranger, 
I've gotten good prices the last couple of years for my corn. At least it seemed a good price. And yet I never seem to be ahead. Do you think the corn laws could be at fault? I always thought those were farmer's laws for my protection. But you know something? A friend of mine heard a speech the other night, and he told me about it. And maybe I've been fooled all these years. Maybe the corn laws aren't doing what they're supposed to. A friend of yours heard a speech? That's right. A smart speech without any of the trimmings. Given by a man who's for the people. The little people. A man named John Bright. I see. So John Bright battled down against odds which seemed impossible. But he convinced the farmers that corn laws worked against their interests. Convinced them they should join in the demand for appeal. Eager as a schoolboy, he rushed off to Cobden with the news. So that's how it went, Richard. Even the farmers are with us now. There's only Parliament left, and Parliament can't resist the country. Sounds splendid, John. Of course, it will be a battle. We'll still need our every bit of strength, our every ounce of mind and muscle. John. Yes, Richard? I can't begin to say how painful this is to me, but... What's wrong? I'm uh, at the end of my rope. Richard, you don't... You can't mean that... Yes, John. I'm through. I'm finished. I'm dropping out. You're resigning from Parliament? I have no choice. No, no, you mustn't. I'm forced to, John. But with victory within our grasp, with the battle as good as won, we need you, Richard. It can't be helped, John. Bankruptcy is... Bankruptcy. As bad as that? The last shiny farthing. I see. I'm sorry. This is a blow. I know. I dread the penury, but I... I think I regret far more giving up the fight. Richard, without you, it isn't a fight. We're lost. Oh, no. No, oh, yes. Uh, no, there must be something. I have tried them all. I didn't want to tell you. Believe me. Richard. Richard, listen to me. That's no use. Listen, we can't let this happen. Well, it has happened. Then we'll repeal it. Exactly as we're going to repeal those corn laws. For repeal them, we must. We've gone too far to lose you now. With you, the result is certain. Your genius for organizing, your quiet logic, and your sanity... They're the real persuasion. I supply the rhetoric, but you batten down the hatches and you get the results. We're not losing you now, Richard. I'm going to see some people. So John Bright orator became John Bright man of action. Faced with the bankruptcy of his friend, incurred in devotion to their mutual fight at the very climax of that fight, Bright left the platform to pound vigorously on polished oaken panels of a number of important doors and some that weren't so polished, nor so important. Uh, but, son... I, I know, Father, and I was certain you'd be reasonable. A draft for 500 pounds is modest, but it will do. Uh, 500? 500 pounds, Father. Thank you. Uh, very well, lad. Very well. And since you've been active in our society from the start, Sir Cecil... Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Bright. Oh, uh, what is this, a, uh, a request for money? Not as a contribution, Sir Cecil. An investment. An investment in victory. Yeah. How much? A mere bagatelle, Sir Cecil. A mere bagatelle. 750 should do very nicely. Really, John, I... I don't know what to say. Now, we agreed a long time ago, Richard. I make the speeches. But it's so much. Will I... it tide you over? That's the point. Tide me over? <laughs> It will save me. And you can save the cause. Why, it restores me to the point where I can even... even think of salvaging the wreck and repaying all those good people. And that's fortunate, because that's the basis on which I got the money. <laughs> John, you're incorrigible. <laughs> At least our Mr. Pearson and his friends in Parliament concur in that. Oh, which reminds me... Yes, we have an appointment with them in Commons. You on the floor. I behind the scenes in caucus and in vestibule. A crucial appointment, Richard. The last, you think? I hope so. So do I. But then, if this is it, if this is victory, John, I'll have been with you all the way. That's all the encouragement I need, Richard. This time we tip the scales. Make it the greatest speech of your career. <laughs> Mr. 
right has the floor. Gentlemen, as I believe I have said to you before, I would like to speak to you about the repeal bill of the nefarious corn laws. What a game! I just heard a gentleman on the other side of the house ask, what, again? I say to that gentleman, which word I use advisedly, yes, again. I have recently returned from a trip which took me into the far corners of England. I talked to the farmers, and I can fairly report that I found them full of discontent. They were content enough until you met them. Not content, merely deluded. But they can be deluded no longer. Because free Englishmen everywhere, in cities and towns, on farm and countryside, at last see the corn laws for what they are. Economic bondage and a political iniquity. Of course, I realize that the things of which I am about to talk cannot be seen from Lloyd's Coffee House, nor from the windows of your private club. But believe me, they can be seen from a furrow that has been washed away. They can be seen from the shabby walls of a tenement and from the rickety limbs of the children who live or should I say, exist there. The facts are so simple that they are terrifying. Number one, there is a potato famine in Ireland. No dissenting view? Good. Number two, that potato famine has spread to England. Again, I find you in complete agreement. Number three, that have been torrential downpours which have ruined our domestic corn crop. Gentlemen, England verges on starvation. The England that you have sworn to protect is looking to you for that protection. Unless you act, unless you abrogate these laws, the people of this country are going to have to endure a famine for which history will hold you responsible. For which they, the people, will hold you responsible. And I, I say only this. As you go home to your well-filled larders, remember as you bite into your evening bread and mutton, and that with every bite, and with every second that passes, an Englishman holds you to account. Well, John, that does it. You think so? I'm sure of it. That speech did exactly what you predicted. It tipped the scale. But there's still the vote. Exactly, the vote. What do you think I've been doing? Oh, John, while you stirred them in the limelight and while you listened to the cheers of the galleries, I've been skulking in the likely corners. Five members here and a half a dozen there. I've sounded them, John. I've seen them all. There's no longer any question. The corn laws are as good as dead. Didn't I say we couldn't win without you? Excuse me, but... Good day, Mr. Cobden. Yes? Oh, why, well, it's Miss Latham. How do you do, my dear? Very well, thank you. Mr. Cobden, would you... Uh... Eh? Oh, why, of course, of course. My colleague, uh, John Bright. Miss Latham. Miss Margaret Latham. How do you do? How do you do? Miss Latham is one of our new enlightened ladies, John. Reads things, you know. Takes a great interest in public matters. Oh, Mr. Bright, I, I do hope you won't think it impertinent of me, but... You were magnificent. Oh, well, <coughs> well, really, I, uh, I mean, uh, not really. But you were, Mr. Bright, simply heroic. Everybody's saying so. Oh, such fire, such, such passion. All England will ring with it. And all England's in your debt. Oh, how can you be so eloquent? Well, really, I, I, believe me, madam, the, that is to say that, 
<laughs> the opposition didn't know this, thank heaven. Huh? Uh, what's that? <laughs> I say, I'm glad the opposition didn't know this. Uh, know what? It takes only a pretty woman to render England's greatest speaker speechless. <laughs> And that's the story. One chapter from the long career of John Bright, champion of the oppressed. For 50 years, one of the giants in Victoria's England. Whether it was corn laws or parliamentary reform, free education or international arbitration, or whether Britain should interfere in America's war between the states, John Bright was ever an eloquent pleader for moderation, for human dignity, for goodwill. A strong voice and a clear one along the way we came. And incidentally, he did eventually marry Margaret Latham and found in her a devoted helpmate for more than a quarter of a century. The NBC University of the Air has brought you Chapter 16 of the new historical series, We Came This Way, Episodes on the High Roads to Human Freedom. We feel that you will enhance your pleasure and profit from this series if you make use of the special handbook which we have prepared to accompany it. You can obtain this handbook by sending 25 cents in cash to cover the cost of printing and mailing to We Came This Way, Box 30, Station J, New York 27, New York. Tonight's script was written by David Harmon and directed by Homer Heck. The original music is composed by Dr. Roy Shield. The orchestra was conducted by Joseph Galicchio. The members of the cast were Clifton Utley as narrator, Sidney Breeze as John Bright, Wilms Herbert as Richard Gobden. Others were Sidney Elstrom, Charles Eggleston, Philip Lord, Claire Baum, Sidney Gare, and Tom Post. 